I am really, really proud of the panel that we put together for solutions. Um, chairing it, we have uh, Congressman Ro Khanna, who has a fantastic book looking at ways in which we can start to regulate tech. He's the uh, congressman for Silicon Valley. He has some incredibly uh, brilliant ideas himself, but he'll be chairing it. Um, we have represented the United Kingdom, Damien Collins MP, who is on the board of the Center for Country and Digital Hate and has been the, the leading voice, one of the leading voices internationally, but certainly in the UK for, for uh, reform. Uh, we have David Shanks, who you've just heard from, Julian Grant, the e-safety commissioner from uh, Australia, um, Peter Fasselnig from the uh, European Union's uh, representation in Washington, D.C., and joining us by Zoom is Anthony Housefather, MP from Canada. And with that, I turn it over to the panel. Well, thank you. Thank you. We've got an in incredible panel, uh, and the purpose of the panel is to propose the concrete solutions to the challenge of disinformation, to the challenge of uh, violence, hate uh, online. Uh, how, do, <clears throat> how do we do this while uh, protecting the First Amendment, free speech values, uh, and what are uh, some of the key uh, regulatory changes we need? What are some of the key enforcement changes we need? So as a start, I thought each uh, panelist could uh, spend a couple of minutes just introducing themselves, uh, maybe providing some context of the issues in their country, uh, and uh, an overview of uh, maybe a, the, the theme of how they think uh, this should be addressed. Maybe a couple of minutes uh, each, and uh, who would like to start? Are, are you looking at me for ladies first? Uh, why don't you go Because I traveled, the, uh, I, I did travel the furthest, just barely. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I actually started my career in Washington, D.C. in Congress, and now I'm bookending my career after 22 years in the technology sector at Microsoft, Twitter, and Adobe as Australia's e-safety commissioner. Um, I've often been called the poacher term gamekeeper, um, and uh, Australians fondly re uh, refer to me as that American. Um, and absolutely, it is absolutely a pleasure um, to be um, embraced by your home country and to be representing the citizens and delivering harms alleviation services. Um, in a com uh, it's a privilege and an honor. It's also the hardest, most challenging, and most rewarding job I've ever done. Um, I was an abject failure um, as a safety antagonist within the tech sector. Uh, I brought the whole concept of safety by design to Microsoft in 2010. Um, I actually started as one of their first lobbyists in Washington, D.C. in 1995, and for my sins, I helped shape this, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. Uh, because at the time, the, you know, the industry was different players. We've, we had Novell and AltaVista and Netscape and AOL, and we truly believed that if the internet was overregulated, that it would stop in its tracks. It hadn't reached its full potential. We did the same with, um, with of course, um, tax laws around e-commerce. Of course, uh, Mark Zuckerberg at the time probably was more worried about pimples and how he was going to get his first girlfriend in, in junior high school than he was thinking about uh, creating um, Facebook. Um, and um, so here we are, 25 years later, Finally, the pendulum is swinging back the right way. Um, but I just wanted to say, um, we started as the Children's E-Safety Commissioner in 2015. So Australia has been regulating for online harms for now that more than seven years. Um, and we've just had our first reform of our online safety bill. So we will have significant new powers around adult serious cyber abuse, but also systemic and process reforms or duty of care around basic online safety expectations, the basic um, expectations we have for companies to operate in, in, in Australia to live up to, um, as well as mandatory industry codes. But we take a full spectrum approach. Obviously, you apply regulation when people report to us um, about youth-based cyberbullying, image-based abuse, so the intimate images that are shared online without consent. About 25% of that is happening on private messaging services, so not in the open, um, or on rogue porn sites. We've got about an 85% success rate in terms of 
of getting that content down. And taking a civil approach in these areas is really um, important because sending victim survivors down a criminal justice pathway is not a good experience for them. Not only do um, police not have the capacity um, to take these cases on board, they'll often say things like, well, why'd you take the picture in the first place? Or why don't you just get off the internet? And of course, going through um, litigation and court, court um, processes is a very painful, re-traumatizing um, situation. So we bolster those protective services with prevention on the front end. We're developing um, tons of uh, research and evidence-based programs, everything from uh, Be Connected for uh, senior citizens. We know that 42% of Australian uh, two-year-olds have access to a digital device. By the time they're four, it's 94%. So we have a program for parents of zero to five-year-olds because parents do need to be the front line of defense and we need to empower them. Uh, we need to work with the schools to be teaching the four R's of the digital age around respect, responsibility, digital resilience, and critical reasoning skills, and so on and so on, cradle to grave. Um, I think we, we cannot um, disagree that uh, the internet has become an essential utility. We wouldn't have been able to work, create, connect, um, or do any of the things that we've done. But we also need to minimize the threat surface for the future, and this is where uh, safety by design and what I call proactive and systemic change comes into play. So we've worked with the industry for the past four years to develop a principles-based framework on what safety by design needs to look like so that risks are assessed up front, safety is a forethought rather than an afterthought, and safety protections aren't retrofitted after the damage has been done. And so uh, the three pillars are pretty easy, and 80, uh, 80 com companies agreed with these that there are service provider responsibilities, that users shouldn't be empowered and have autonomy, and that there must be much more radical transparency and accountability. Um, and we have seen some incremental changes, uh, maybe not monumental changes, but we've developed risk assessment tools for both startups and large companies to be able to assess their risks, surface up best practices that, that companies are using, because innovation and good business practice is part of safety by design. But we're bolstering that with the basic online safety expectations, and within the next two months, we'll be able to compel transparency and uh, accountability um, in terms of where sy systemic failures are happening. And the seven years of trends data that we've got from the individual complaint schemes tells us very much where those systemic failures are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how about we just go right down the line? For me? Yes. yes. Sure. Um, how do we fix it? That's the question, right? I've forgotten. And, and a little bit of a background. <laughs> oh, a little bit of background. I, I, don't think, I don't think I need to go too much into that. I've just been sharing fairly intensively on that front. But um, yeah, look, in my role as CEO of the classification office, um, absolutely, as I've just been saying, the, the whole game was thinking about actually how, how do we architect the situation to make this better because essentially I was applying 1993 content and media regulatory principles to the internet of today and, and fundamentally it, it didn't work but I look at the situation here in the US it's the same right so the Communications Decency Act 1996 you know if, if a few years newer than the 1993 regulation that I operated on. Um, I, I think Dr. Franks did a, did a beautiful um, dissection and breakdown of actually what you need to do to fix that prohibition on public liability, to, to move that section of the duty of care um, kind of pie. And in terms of regulation, well, obviously we're seeing big moves in, in the EU, the UK, Australia's moving, um, New Zealand's also doing a content regulatory review. But in the US, you know, I, I didn't fully understand all the um, implications of the De Sousa Act that um, Congresswoman, Congresswoman Trahan was, was taking us through earlier. And uh, you know what? That sounds basically about right to me in terms of the elements that she stepped through in terms of the regulatory oversight, the, the research, the, the, the adjust, uh, addressing the transparency and inequities in the system. That's all sensible stuff and, and moving in the right direction. Um, 
and I've already talked about the, the, the concept of the need for some sort of public expectation in this space, which is all over the map. And some of what I was saying about my, my story about responding to Christchurch was essentially a public communications story. It's talking to people about what's expected, what's the standard for their behaviour. Well, what about the standard and expectations that apply to these corporations? And um, the New York Times has just come out with an article today, I think, talking about you know, the ongoing dispersal of the very material that I was talking about. So believe me, I'm, I'm under no misapprehension about what my legal determination of that content um, had in terms of the overall and ongoing grievous um, effect of this material. But it did have an effect, and particularly in our country, in terms of setting a standard, setting some expectations, adjusting norms and approaches. And, and I think all of the moves and steps that I'm seeing are really steps in that direction. Mostly, I, they, they mostly make sense to me and resonate with um, us operating our research function as, as, a, as a classification office, which again was a key public communications and understanding tool. Um, so th these are all good ideas. My, my exhortation would be move on them. Do it. Don't, you know, none of these things will be perfect. You will never get a perfect solution to any of these problems. They are deeply complex. But if you move, you will almost certainly make things better and you will learn from that move. And you'll be able to learn and adjust and go again. And that's the game we're in, given the, the pace of technological development and change. Thank you. Go ahead. You two had to travel a long way to come here. I had to travel a whole five blocks to get <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Peter Fatelnik. I'm working for the European Union representation here in town in DC. And there I'm handling all the digital economy policy. We are fairly small shops, so sort of I cover a wide area. But the last, the last 12 months, I have been the front person for the Digital Services Act here in town. Uh, it was sort of a really good conversation the last 12 months. There was a lot of interest. It was difficult at times, very difficult at many times, I, I would say, but here we are. Now, the Digital Services Act was just sort of maybe an intermediary step, and you were describing a process actually here. In the European Union, we, we have actions countering hate speech ongoing since many, many years. So I'm just kind of coming back to 2016 when the first four of were put together, when best practices were developed, as you discussed. 2018, a code of practice was put in, in motion and more than a dozen companies are adhering to that. But I heard a very interesting phrase this morning in a panel suggesting that, you know, we are still at the stage of begging billionaires. And and, and that really resonated with me because, in fact, as well, all what we have done is pretty much voluntary, working with the companies, a uh, bit sort of living off the goodwill they're they are giving us in this space. And I think the Digital Services Act now sort of puts at least the first step where we have to rise the floor for everybody. You know? and, and I'm happy to discuss then a bit more where, where this is going to be. Uh, effective, but everything has been mentioned, you know, it's all about this transparency, responsibility. I liked a lot, a strong emphasis of the DSA is on researchers' access, because actually we, we, we need to start learning. We haven't even mm. done that yet. So, so this is only, or can only be a first step, which puts us in a direction to understand better what could be the actions we need to take. Of course we are mindful that, that uh, we don't want to take away free speech, expression of free, of freedom of expression is a cherished right in the European Union. Of course, there are economic interests, but I think we can walk and chew gum a little bit. So, so and this is a little bit what we try here. But I, I stop here and look forward to the conversation. Um, thank you. I'm Damien Collins, Member of Parliament in the United Kingdom. I chaired the Joint Committee on the Online Safety Bill, uh, which uh, analysed the uh, UK government's Online Safety Bill uh, before it was introduced to Parliament. Uh, which it was in April, and it went through its first big vote on the floor of the House without a vote, which, was, uh, which gives you an idea of just how strong a cross-party consensus, consensus there is around the need uh, to legislate, to create minimum safety standards, to empower independent regulators with the right to audit the companies for their performance, 
to create codes of practice and risk assessments for how they uh, moderate harmful content online. Uh, and in particular, the, the right to not just request information, but to know whether all the relevant information has been given, to go within the companies to get access to information that they need to make sure the companies are complying. So our expectation is the online safety bill will be law by the end of this year or the very beginning of next year. And it's been the culmination of a lengthy process, which um, I think 2018, I chaired the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, and we did a big inquiry on disinformation and fake news at that point where we said there needed to be basic standards and independent regulator uh, setting standards in the tech sector. And, um, and that went through various government consultations through to this bill now. I agree with something that was said right at the start in the, f the first panel, which is that, uh, well, first or second panel today, which was that in the tech sector, self-regulation effectively means no regulation. You know, you think if Facebook believed in, in even any kind of basic standards of regulation, they would give their own oversight board the powers they've asked for to initiate their own investigations, but they won't even do that. You know, which gives you know they've seen this coming for four years in the Europe and and, and the UK and Australia, and have done the minimum or nothing to respond to it. You know, they'll wait for the legislation to pass. So it is imperative that we if we care about these issues that we set the standards. And I'll just say finally, I think that actually what we've got at the moment, people raise the freedom of speech issues, but what we have now is we have tech companies regulating free speech based on their terms of service not the law, you know, mm. and, and using their get out, their freedom from liability to do nothing about really serious harms, yep. you know, about, you know, to harms that are affecting children, you know, harms that are protecting self-abuse, harms that are defrauding people. These are not freedom of speech rights, you know. This is just a basic failure to apply the criminal law as it exi exists in a regulated environment online. And that, that, I think, is what we have to fix. 100%. Perfect. Damien, whether, maybe we'll go to you, because uh, the um, point... We've, we've, we've got um, Anthony Housefeather. Oh, go ahead. I did, sorry, Anthony, go ahead. Thanks, thanks Ro. Um, and, and first of all, let me start by apologizing uh, for not being there with you today. Uh, my name is Anthony Housefather. I'm a member of the Canadian House of Commons. I represent a district in the West End of Montreal. Um, and unfortunately tonight, uh, my minister and I, I'm the Parliamentary Secretary for Public Services and Procurement. For Americans, this that weird dichotomy of where your cabinet ministers are also legislators. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of like the assistant secretary. We're in the house taking questions for four hours, or I would have been there. Um, so uh, to start with, I, I got into this uh, similar to Julie. I was the general counsel of a tech multinational before I was elected in 2015. Uh, when I was elected in 2015, I chaired the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights of the Canadian House of Commons, uh, similar to the Judiciary Committee in, in the US. And we did a, a detailed study uh, about online hate. Um, and came out with various recommendations that were put forward um, to, uh, to, to implement into legislation for the government. Um, then I sort of dived into a, a deeper area, uh, which is I think why I was invited. Um, I founded and, and am one of the, the co-chairs of, of an international task force to fight online anti-Semitism, uh, which is a bipartisan group of legislators uh, from the United States, Ro, uh, your colleague De Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, and Ted Deutsch and I uh, uh, work together a lot. Um, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, um, and Israel, uh, essentially the English speaking world in Israel. And we're recently brought into uh, to work, start working with the EU as well. Um, and, and, and basically, what we've done is done a deep dive into all of our countries, which have different charters, different Bill of Rights, um, different laws. Um, to see where we could find common ground uh, because we can't make the platforms work in, a, you know, in 25 different ways in 25 different countries. We, we, you know, one of the things that I think we've, we've learned if we start looking at solutions is that self-regulation has abjectly failed. And, and the way I look at it is in our North American context, we talk about marketplace of ideas. We tend to believe that free speech is important, but it's balanced by counter speech the way it was in the old New England public meetings. And, and that's not the case uh, today because al algorithmically amplified threats drive hate to hate. And so you can no longer look at the platforms as being solely able to self-regulate and, and leave it all to private business. Um, so uh, we in Canada right now are looking um, at an online harms bill, uh, you know, in a similar framework to the United Kingdom. We're still at the consultation phase as we tabled the bill before the last election uh, and then the election came. There was a lot of criticism from the, uh, the advocates of free speech and, uh, and saying the bill went too far. So now we're in a new consultation phase. 
Um, but I, you know, in, in the end result, the important things are having access to data, which is incredibly important um, for both civil society and for any regulator we put in place. Um, we need to have under, uh, an understanding of the transparency of the algorithms. We need algorithmic transparency. Um, and, and I believe we need a regulator. We need regulation uh, and enforced legislation uh, to, 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 to give the regulator a path um, to, to allow them to actually regulate the platforms. And I'll be happy to you know, talk further on questions. Thanks. Thank you. All um, great, great comments. <clears throat> I think there was a consensus where many people brought up the point that uh, self-regulation has, has not worked. Uh, and the question then is, what is, uh, in your view, the essence of the appropriate regulatory regime? And more, if you can also address, how would you enforce it? Just having represented Silicon Valley, I can tell you, uh, you know, sometimes the interns may notice the fines. I mean, it's really the nuisance factor for a lot of these tech uh, executives, and they'll fly into Brussels every now and then, but their market share is increasing, they'll forum shop for the right place. I, I don't think they have dark patterns. I, I really don't think they view it as a significant obstacle. Uh, so what can actually get them the enforcement? I, th I think yeah. there, we have to think of the drivers of the companies. You know, we often talk about if there's a will, there's a way. There's been a way for a long time. Um, there just hasn't been the will at the top. And it's all about leadership. And, and uh, you know, I, I remember being at Microsoft. Remember when widow, Windows was whittled, was sorry, was riddled with um, security vulnerabilities. In 2001, he called for the Trustworthy Computing Initiative, and he took every single engineer off every project, and they re, they recoded hundreds of millions of lines of Windows code to make it more secure. And then he he set up the Trustworthy Computing Division, which which I worked in. Um, to you know, continue that work for another 10 years. So if any of these CEOs said, issued a mandate and said, we are going to make safety a priority, we're going to engineer out misuse, we're gonna understand the risks, we're going to build the protections in at the front end rather than retrofitting after it's been done, it can happen. My experience has been that, that the companies respond to three things. Regulation, seriously harmful regulation, reputational damage, and then revenue changes. And we saw that again with YouTube when terrorist content and child sexual abuse material was being served against uh, YouTube videos and thousands of national advertisers pulled out. They lost a billion dollars of market cap in a week and they changed that algorithm right quick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, I, th I, think, I mean, with, with the UK online safety bill, there are built in big fines. So the maximum fine would be 10% of global revenues that could be levied. Um, if companies don't comply with the regulator in terms of uh, either responding to the, the regulator's uh, risk registers or, or handing over information the regulator's required, then a named company director would face criminal sanctions for that. But I, I agree, I think public shaming has a, quite a big role to play. Um, if you can demonstrate bad things that are happening, Often I think the companies have responded to public shaming, but public shaming has occurred because of whistleblowers or investigations or, or discovery in a, in a court, and that brings new information out. Where we have regulators that have access to more information more readily, then I think that does change the nature of the debate. And I would bring in the competition debate as well. I mean, I thought one of the interesting pieces of research Francis Haugen published, looking at the survey of British and American teenage girls on Instagram, showing that they had heightened levels of anxiety, well, a significant people in the sample had heightened levels of anxiety and depression from the service, but, but felt they had to carry on using it anyway. I would say that's a pretty good example of abusive market power. If you can create a really miserable experience for people, but they can't not use your service because there's nowhere else to go, I would question, you know, from a competition law point of view, whether these companies are too big. Could, could I add here? I, th I, th I think the, the, the factors you have been pointing out are quite clear for drivers for the companies, but, you know, the first and foremost, the goal of every regulation is compliance very clear, you know, compliance is what we want to achieve as fast as possible. And compliance on, on complex issues like this will also require a certain level of cooperation. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, certain laws, I mean, like the DSA, you just can't throw them over the wall and then mm -hmm. say, you know, mm -hmm. guys just come up with the solution. So there will be a process for the next, I'm just saying now a year, but it probably will be longer than a year, the process of how, we get, how do we get from where we are into full compliance. And that's not necessarily that during that period, big fines are not going to help you. Uh, 
I mean, there is a certain nature, uh, natural speed with which things can change in companies. You referred to recoding 100 million lines of code. I mean, so I think we should also be mindful that this will be a lift for everybody, for the public sector, for the companies. Though I fully agree, you know, without the, the, the carrots and the stick, it's not going to work. So a good stick is always a useful thing in every legislation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not taking serious. If I could um, chime in for a sec, I, I think one of these the issues here is there really needs to be an international holistic approach. I mean, holistic mm -hmm. I uh -huh. is important. It's not just going to be legislation that enforces the powers of the regulator that will make things work. There has to be cooperation from the companies. But we also have to understand from uh, you know, a financial perspective, the company cannot be asked to be doing different things in every different market. And we need to work together, I, I think, a lot more to establish how the regulators way across the world, at least across the English speaking world, um, in, in order to prevent companies from saying everything is too difficult. Um, and, and I also think, uh, just to throw in my, my other point on this, I, I think we need to be um, you know, careful in criminal content, what, what, what hate posts that are criminal are, are one thing in terms of giving legislative powers to a regulator you know, to, to heavily fine, to imprison uh, if you don't take it off. Uh, there, there's, there, there's, there's a very big difference between what is then not criminal in a country versus what's criminal. And we have to have a careful distinction between that. Mm. I think, Anthony, you raise a very good point of, you know, that, that uh, too long there was a divide and conquer with or industry has been able to drive, you know, doing certain things in this country, doing certain things, mm -hmm. or let's say the minimum in whatever country they have been active. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real obligation on our side now to get together as well and say, look, look at us here. You know, we, we have common views. We would like from your side as well, common solutions to these problems. And we want you to, to apply those solutions, not only in our legal territory, but around the world. I mean, it wouldn't stop them from doing that in other countries, which perhaps do not have the, the ability to have these conversations. Can I give the uh, companies credit for doing some things? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, um, you know, we run the individual complaint schemes and um, the, the way the schemes work is uh, for, at least for youth-based cyberbullying and adult cyber abuse, the, the child or the adult has to report to the platform first. We're not here to be the content moderators of the internet. The most expeditious way to get that content down and their responsibility goes to them. But what's re realistically happening is that things are falling through the cra cracks. They have high volumes. They don't understand um, context and culture. They outsource their content moderation to Romania and to the Philippines and to uh, Texas. And um, you know, one of the first cases I dealt with was some, someone not understanding that showing the image of a deceased indigenous person was deeply offensive to their culture. So we are bridging this inherent power gap, but I have a 90% success rate, a compliance rate with the, um, the major platforms on youth-based cyberbullying because they don't want that content either. And because we have a legislative threshold and we issue a regulatory investigation, it has to be seriously harassing, threatening, intimidating, or humiliating. I've had Instagram get off violent, um, violent fight videos in as little as 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. So they, they can work with us. I've got an 85% uh, compliance rate um, with taking down image-based abuse. They're all overseas targets. But what we need are more pincher moves. And this is why I, we feel that we've got a vested interest in ex explaining what we do and how it's working so that we can bring people along, so that we don't have a regulatory splinter net. Um, and one of the things that we, we, we want to do is set up um, a global regulatory network just as there is a global privacy assembly. We can do some capacity building, but this may, may help us be on the same trajectory. Well, I, I think these sort, of, these sort of dialogues are really important between different governments and the sort of conversation we're having now. I think if we'd said, let's do nothing until we all agree, then, then we, I would, if I was a tech lobbyist, that's what I'd be lobbying for, because then yeah, you know, yeah, nothing yeah, will yeah. happen. Um, but what we'll see is that, I mean, we will, we will look, learn from each other. You know, Australia brought in its legislation on compensation for news companies. Canada's looking to do the same, the UK as well. I would imagine in Europe, you know, people will look at the online safety uh, bill and the DSA, and if you know, we think one piece of legislation is doing better, then we'll say, well, can we make one more like the other? Because we'll, we'll look to raise standards together. The other thing I think will be interesting, in financial services, you know, we have legislation that covers the globe. America has the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We have the Bribery Act in the UK. So British and American companies are held responsible for what they operate in anywhere in the world. I don't think it will be... Ex I don't think it'd be acceptable here in tech is if we created legislation in Europe and North America and yet 
Facebook, say, or, or, or YouTube allowed something to happen elsewhere in the world that was a clear, fragrant breach of it. For them to say, oh, well, it may be banned in America but it won't, or in Europe, but it's not banned in uh, South America. You know? mm. I just think that would be acceptable. And I think that would be another way of looking at how do we, out, you know, outside of the global north, how do we help raise standards for global companies that are headquartered in the global north? Mm. Yeah. I, I, would, I would strongly agree. We need a coordinated mm. approach. And um, fines, um, they, they are largely symbolic in this context, but they're a powerful symbol. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I think a point needs to be made that I, I think you do need a regulator that you are looking at to manage all of this. Um, and a really important point about that is the regulator must be independent and must be seen to be independent. So that's mm. a really key aspect of what um, Julie and I have been doing in our respective um, jurisdictions. And it's critically important. I noted the exchange earlier with the earlier panel about De Sosa, you know, how's that going to work? And the comment was, well, I'm not sure that I'd want, you know, a political party with kind of the ability to control those levers. And I went, wow, that's true. If that could happen, that's a real concern. So part of your architecture must put those levers into an independent realm, which can be done, but is vitally important. And in terms of, you know, an industry kind of willing to, 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 to work with a regulatory system, I mean, I think one thing that will not work for sure is the traditional regulatory approach where you lay down the law, you set out the parameters, and then there's no further interaction except to go, oh, we're now prosecuting you for breach of regulation. That will never, ever work in this space. I can guarantee it. But um, you know, our experience in New Zealand, we, we introduced a regulatory regime in relation to streaming content. Um, you know, the Netflix um, and, and Neons and, you know, the, the online content um, subscription services to, to classify material in a, in a consistent way according to what New Zealanders would expect if they went to see content at the movie theatre or the like. A, a, a relatively simple move, but it's surprising how complex these things can get. But the point is, the plat I, I was thinking, wow, how is an Amazon going to react to having a regulator in New Zealand with 7 million people you know, setting down a requirement. And you know what? They were fine. As soon as it was clear what the requirement was, and most importantly, as soon as they understood that we were willing to spend time with them and deal and, and, and work out a reasonable, you know, approach that was going to be iterative, it was fine. It, it, it has been put in place and, and working through. And I think actually those experiences for me just says, just start. Just do it. Just do it. Right, well, you've all uh, spoken about the need for international cooperation and some form of uh, consensus. A, a very basic question, how does it work now? And we, we see Facebook in America, there's all this hate speech, provocative speech, other things. Are, are, is there a different version in, in Europe where some people aren't allowed to get onto those pages? Or what is the restriction currently? Or are they seeing the same exact thing that we're seeing? And how uh, then? Should there be coordination? Go ahead, Anthony. Hey, thanks so much. Well, that's really interesting because, of course, just like you wrote, I've had the opportunity to question Facebook at uh, at parliamentary committees, and and I find that it's almost shocking. In countries where, for example, Holocaust denial is illegal, they will take down content that they won't take down in North America. So essentially, you know, when you're talking about feeding hate to hate, right? If you're if you're somebody who's attuned to believing the Holocaust is, is a hoax. Um, if you access right now in Canada or the United States um, pages on Facebook, um, even though they, they say that they've made deals with, you know, Yad Vashem to send you to, uh, you know, to, to, to knowledge about the Holocaust, you're almost always or invariably ending up at Holocaust denial pages. Whereas if you would do this in Germany, you would not um, because they've taken the time to deal with the criminal law in that country that, that, that blocks them um, for, you know, being Holocaust denial in Germany is a crime. The Facebook actually changes their algorithms, I think, to and, and, and certainly has more content moderators to stop that from ever happening. And, and it's one of these these things where um, I, I wanted to just get back on the on the other point. It's really important for governments to talk. It's really important for regulators to talk. It's also important for legislators to talk, um, because I don't believe if there's not bipartisan understanding and bipartisan consensus that hate speech is not necessarily free speech and that you know, and, 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 that, and that imposing these limitations on the platform is not censorship and, and a violation of free speech. I don't think we're going to actually get anywhere with a population at large. And maybe it's illusory to believe in today's climate 
we're going to have pybartics and consensus. But if there's ever a topic we can have it on, I think it's this. Um, so, so, I mean, is it, it's not so, I mean, the uh, example there, I mean, in Germany, there are, there are hate speech laws that are applied online. So, that, so things are slightly different there. France has some disinformation laws that apply during election periods. Um, in general, though, I mean, the, the basis of regulation in Europe, both in the UK and in Europe, is based really on the e-commerce directive, which means that illegal speech, illegal content has to, be, has to be removed once it's reported to the company. So the shift, the big shift here is with, with these legislations is a proactive responsibility for, for illegal content. So that would be terrorist content, child sexual images. The online safety bill then adds in a... So then they would remove it in, in Europe, but we would still see it in America and Canada. You, well, you could, you, you could do. I mean, this would be a, a proactive shift. So if the company's still here, I mean, with that kind of worst, worst most illegal content, you know, certainly child sexual images in America, they would have to remove. But, um, but here you would see a proactive responsibility, not reactive. And, uh, and that's really important because you think in their transparency reports, they, what they always say is our AI discovers 90% of the content we remove before it's reported. But how much do they actually remove? That's 90% 90 of what they take down, but how much is that? Now, according to Francis Haugen, Facebook engineers believe they only take down 5% of hate speech on the platform. Mm -hmm. So they're congratulating themselves for taking down 90% of the 5%, mm -hmm. and we don't know any, anything about the rest. So, uh, and every time you ask them about this, the, the, even the people they put up in the hearings, they can't explain what the transparency reports actually mean, you know, right. or won't commit themselves to any, to any, any figures about them. So what you would, the shift you would see, I think, with the new regimes would be not just on this uh, illegal content of child sexual images and terrorist content, but on other offenses in law, you know, where we have race hate, you know, for example, we have legislation on race hate, we have court um, cases where the, the threshold has been established for what it is. You then see proactive responsibilities for the companies to remove that as well. And, they, and, their, and the role of the regulator will be to understand whether the companies have effective systems in place to do it. And if they don't, the companies have the choice of either creating those systems or, or facing the, the wrath of the regulator. And so I think you could see, while, this, while it's at this moment in time, this, the, what you see in Europe and America is rel relatively similar. By this time next year, it could start to look quite different. Absolutely. I was just going to say about that data, the Facebook mm. also won't tell you um, that that content that they removed, that 90% has been mm. on there for um, two years mm. yeah. and that uh, it's been on shared a million times and, um, you know, it's been seen. So this is what our basic online safety expectations and the transparency notifications we're going to start um, implementing. Um, in August will look at. We will be able to compare, ask very precise questions about how they're either tackling specific issues like recidivism of bad actors onto platforms, how they're tack tackling um, volumetric attacks, uh, whatever it is. Um, and if they don't reply, then we have powers to name and mm. shame or to fine them. Um, and our mandatory industry codes, which we're negotiating right now, it's been very interesting because I have a red line around proactive detection and removal of illegal content. And uh, I'm getting pushed back on, why do, does it have to be proactive? Can it be preventative? And I'm like, well, if it's preventative, then it's status quo. It's what we're doing today. And I'm not interested in having codes that aren't moving the bar and raising safety standards. Same thing about detection. They're wordsmithing. Um, well, we don't need to detect it. If you're not detecting that content, then you're letting it live there. Um, and just uh, you know, applying end-to-end -end encryption is not going to be your answer either. Just because you turn off the light doesn't mean you should be resolve, uh, absolved of responsibility. So we've got to we've got to stop the warming out of these type things and be really, really um, a, a, as as regulators and those that are developing the policies know how they're trying to game the system. Because I hear all the time, oh, we're leaning into regulation, but really what they mean is we want you to regulate us the way we want to be regulated, yeah. which is well, very little. I get both of you in, but just to push the uh, analogy, I mean, so you could could you see a world where. Let's say Americans get to hear from Donald Trump on Twitter and Facebook, but Europeans don't. They do use some geo-blocking um, now, but I don't think that is the answer. And this is what I thought was really mm. interesting about what um, you know, Marianne Franks was saying. Freedom of speech isn't the same as a free-for-all. And um, we, our legislative threshold around serious adult cyber abuse is that I have to prove serious intent to harm an Australian individual, and it has to be menacing, harassing, and offensive in all cases to an ordinary, reasonable person, which is a very high bar. So what we're targeting is not political speech, not defamation, not harmful, and even offensive speech. It's that speech that veers into the area of serious harm 
doxing and cyber stalking and death threats and, and the like. How can you say that, that that is a suppression of free speech? In fact, I think it is elevating free speech because what I saw every day at Twitter was it's, it was meant to be a great leveler to promote voices, but if you don't protect those voices, then you're suppressing them. And online targeted abuse, um, we know that those are indigenous, identify as LGBTQI, um, are women, are of diverse uh, backgrounds. They're three times more likely to be targeted than a yeah. white European male, sorry. Well, I, 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 think the, I think there is a slight danger that the whole debate becomes focused on you know, should Donald Trump have a Twitter account or not, rather than saying... Every well, debate in America gets yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that, uh, I can understand why it's a big debate, but um, it's saying, actually, okay, what about, you know, what about protecting children? What about, you know, d stopping people from being defrauded? What about the prom stopping the promotion of, you know, of self-harm and suicide, you know, which, which these aren't really freedom of speech issues. This is about basic human protections that we have in law already. And then, 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 of course, I think actually what we're doing is looking to translate things that, that we say are illegal offline into a regulatory system online and basing it on that. And most of that is not really about freedom, freedom of expression, or if it is, it's certainly on the side of the line that says that, that freedom of expression is, is harming people. And there's always existed in law that tension between p what people are allowed to say and the harm that can credibly do other people. And I think that's, that, that's where the way we have to come at this. And actually, it's not the it's not the job of a of an online regulator to regulate political debate, you know, to say whose facts are correct or not, or or you know whose statements are right or not. If a political leader is inciting a riot yes. or telling people to take a drug to, that'll cure them but will actually kill them, then these are these are these are sort of we have laws that deal with that, you know, and therefore it's really about how you how you how you create a framework to enforce those laws online. No, go ahead. Uh, what do you want to? No, I mean, no. the only reason I bring this up is because they, you know, all my colleagues on the Republican side, this is all they would be talking about. This is why Congress, <laughs> this is why Congress hasn't been able to pass the laws. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're far more concerned that uh, it, that Twitter and Facebook and others are improperly removing speakers than they are about mm -hmm. about these concerns. Mm -hmm. I share the view of the panel, but if you want to know why the legislation isn't moving in mm -hmm. Congress, it's to, it's important to understand what probably almost. 95% of Republican senators or Congress people would. I think, yeah, go oh, ahead. Please. I was just going to say the other thing I think we have to be concerned about in terms of coming from the platforms is they're saying, okay, okay, Theta Company will remove illegal content, but why should we re remove harmful content? And, uh, you know, we have this, of course, with our image based abuse, the non consensual sharing of intimate images and videos is is um, not necessarily criminal. Uh, we had an investigation um, which the New York Times did a story on um, a, a, on a site called um, Sanctioned Suicide that was operated by some very, very bad people. Um, and uh, we were able to block it. Um, a, a child who was 18 years old learned how to make a potion and killed himself. So it wasn't a hypothetical harm. An Australian had actually died. Um, and while we were able to shut that down, I then went to the um, Bing, Microsoft's Bing and Google search and said, hey, this is, this is like showing young people who are vulnerable where to po point the gun to get their brain stem. This actually has a chat that encourages people to go into the light when they're very vulnerable. Um, this is incitement to suicide. Can you please de-index this? And they said, well, no, we just put a mirror up to the world. It's not patently illegal. We just put a mirror up to society. We don't decide what's right and wrong. Um, so, so again, now there's been congressional hearings. We've now, we now have law, we, in our new law, we can compel, de, uh, delete, we can send link deletion notices, and we can also compel the app stores to deplatform the Omegles and the kicks of the world that we know have been used to, to um, groom young children um, and are violating their, their terms of service, but they're not acting on them. So there is a lot of responsibility up and down the stack, and there are a lot of players that may not be, you know, Facebook is getting a lot of the limelight here, but there are a lot of players that um, are engaging in malfeasance. Just look at a Apple. Um, in 2019, Facebook um, submitted 21 million um, reports of child sexual abuse imagery to NECMEC. You know how many Apple? Um, <laughs> eight. Eight. You can't tell me with 1.2 billion handsets in the world um, and iMessage and iCloud that they only had eight instances of child sexual abuse material. So in the three years where I've asked them, what are you scanning? Are you scanning? This is your legal, you know, why aren't you sending more to, um, 
to uh, NECMEC. They said they decide what is child pornography or not, and um, they can't tell us whether or not they scan or what they scan because we might use it against them. So in, I certainly in, plan to. In, in, information, information asymmetry, right? That's yeah. The thing. It's, yeah. It's right. Compl we're, we're dealing with a completely asymmetric information landscape here. You know, so even just fixing that in a meaningful, taking a meaningful step to fix that, it's going to get us a long way. Do I sound, do I sound angry? <laughs> uh, but I am. I mean, enough is enough, right? But I, I think you stand fantastic. I, I, I think, though, that Roe was bringing up what is a legitimate political problem, and this is where I think legislators need to talk to each other and why I was saying before we need to have bipartisan consensus to be able to actually move legislation forward, um, at least in North America, um, because what he was saying is correct, right? We're, we're at a point where there are many um, on the right side of the spectrum who believe that social media is stacked against them and that any attack on uh, or removal from social media is a violation of free speech. And, and we need to disabuse that notion. We need to find a way uh, to make broader civil society understand, and not, not just those of us on the left, but, but everyone, that the, uh, the dangers that, that flow from, from what is left up online, at least the criminal content of it. And we're not there right now in North America. We continue to have a broad group of people that believe even taking off this type of content uh, will violate their free speech. And they all, you know, and he, he's right, will associate this with uh, with taking Donald Trump off Twitter, uh, the candidate, candidate equally so. Um, and, 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 and that's why I think, again, legislators need to talk to each other because I think with broad education, we'll be able to find common ground that isn't necessarily apparent uh, on many other issues. Your problem's in the prairies, Anthony. Yeah. But also, I, I think also the definition around what speech is, actually. I, you know, you can I can post something on my Facebook page. Do I have a right that says Facebook should share that with a million people? You know, the Facebook, to make money, has decided what I've said is so interesting, it wants to artificially boost that audience. You know, if I give a pre-recorded interview to CNN and they say, you know what, that was rubbish, we're not going to broadcast it, it's not an infringement on my, my freedom of speech rights. You know, yeah, right. you know, if I send a press release to the Washington Post that don't print it, it's not a, my freedom of speech rights haven't been impeached. impeached. And I think this, on, on Section 230, there's this interesting thing is to say, should Section 230 apply when someone puts up a posting, but not apply if Facebook chooses to boost it to make money, you know, or, 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 or YouTube the same. And actually, we've conflated these two things and created the sense that people have a right to be actively boosted, you know, artificially, simply so that the platform they're on can make more money out of them. Well, I think this, 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 this conversation mm. now leads to the point of, you know, the, the social media companies are media companies. That's it. I mean, yeah. they, it's their choice. Uh, and, and this is either part of the terms of reference or part of their business model, but it's their choice on what content they amplify. It's not, it's not a public square, yeah. any of them. I, I think that's right. And also the amplification process shows also that this is, this is neither novel or difficult for them, you know, because no. we're asking them to apply effectively the technology they use at the moment to, to target advertising and to boost content to keep people safe. And if I, if I was a charity and said, I've got a, I do a lot of work with uh, teenage girls that have mental health problems, um, I've, got a, I've got a sample audience of 10,000 people. I've got their permission to, to use that audience on Facebook. I want to buy a lookalike audience of a million people that are the closest possible data match to them. Facebook would sell me that information without any buy or leave. That's entirely what the system is designed to do, which means that they themselves can predict and identify people who are likely to have all the same problems. So why don't they use that information to help keep people safe, to not boost and amplify content that will cause harm to the people who are the most vulnerable? You know, that, that, that is, in, in terms of, that is what we're asking them to do. They do, it, they do it to make money, but they, we want them to do it to keep people safe. I don't think that has to be mutually exclusive either. No. I think there, there are ways that they, you know, they can use nudges, for instance, um, and they can, they can pick up when a child is, um, you know, or somebody is experiencing suicidal ideation, for instance, mm. and surface up, you know, that that person's in yeah. the UK or in France, and, you know, here's the um, lifeline or the um, suicide um, hot hotline that you can call. There are a lot of things they, they can do, but it, it does come down to profit motive and mm. stickiness um, and, you know, using those algorithms to sur surface up and bring people into a spiral or down a rabbit hole or into an ec ec eco chamber is hugely profitable. Well, yeah, none of these companies have built up processes and infrastructure. 
and not the technology to deal with it. And mm. probably until they are forced to do so, they may probably choose not to do so. Mm. And, and that, that's, I think, part of also this conversation, part of the regulatory attempts we're all making, you know, yeah. putting in place processes, which perhaps first and foremost should look at, at illegal content, uh, which is sort of regulatory, the easy stuff to look at, but which will certainly have a tremendous impact on how these companies are operating on a more general basis. Yeah. In Canada, they call it lawful, but awful. Yeah. I love that, yeah, for but, harmful. Well, the structure, the structure in their income, I mean, we had, we had um, the joint committee that I chaired, we had Antigone Davis from Facebook give evidence to us, as so she gave evidence to the Senate. It was rather interesting to try and work out who she reported to in the company. The, the, um, that she wasn't unable, she wasn't able to tell us that, but she did. She did. They did. Say, Facebook did it in writing afterwards and said that she was, what, I think, global head of security. But she reported into Monica, Monica Bickett, who's who's a policy lead. So you've got the safety people reporting to the policy people who report into the lawyers. And that is not a that is not a structure of a company that is primary concern is keeping people safe. That's a yeah. that's a company that is, that it, that uses these people that uses the idea they have safety policies to, to limit their liability, not to actually protect yeah. people. They actually report into the um, political people, the yeah. government relations people, which is even worse. It's like having a philanthropic um, organization report into marketing. Mm. Um, and and you know you you know as as someone who spent 22 years in the industry, you're not going to have effective safety program unless you have a lot of engineers working for you because the engineer is king. Um, and if you don't have that technical support, you're not going to be effective. Yeah. I mean, what would a newspaper look like if it was edited by the ad sales people? That's effectively what you've got <laughs> exactly. there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which is funny because we have plenty of other safety critical industries. I mean, yeah. that's not the way to run a nuclear power plant. You no, know? No. So, uh, we, we do know that perfectly well in many other industries, aviation is another one. Mm. And, and here suddenly we, everything seems to be impossible. Mm. Um, actually, somebody from um, uh, Facebook actually said to me, well, the reason we don't do safety by design, Julie, is because it's hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's okay. probably true. They try harder. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it depends what the metrics are. If you think, that if, the, if, the, if the, the, the guiding philosophy seems to be net engagement is positive, therefore engagement is positive. Mm. You know, and then, but you know, if you've got a company that means 10% of people have a measurable time, that's every month, that's 28 million people you know, around the world. So what, what rights do they have you know, in, terms of the, the, in terms of how that service is run? And, uh, and you know, I think this, this idea that net engagement is positive has made them blind to the faults that clearly exist and the, the real experiences many people have. There are good people that work at these companies, and you know, I think we saw that with Sophie. I'd like to think I was somebody who um, really wanted, you know, believed in the power of technology for good. That's why I, I, I joined these companies, and um, do believe they revolutionize things. Um, so, you know, I do want to recognize that we work with people and companies day in and day out who mm. are trying to do the right thing um, and, and are pushing. But they're pushing against G-forces. I often talk about being at the front of the Peloton as, as the first online safety regulator. And, you know, we're pushing against all sorts of drag and resistance. But I'm so, so grateful and excited that you've got all these other countries that are coming on board because to counter the stealth, the wealth, the power. Some of these companies are at nation state level. Um, we really need to band together and partnership, cross sector partnership is going to be critical if we're going to be successful in, in, in making the online world a safer, more civil place. And, and we can't look at everything as black and white. I mean, I mean, again, like just like most uh, other things, these companies do a lot of good and they do harm. And uh, you know they're, they're seeking to maximize profits for shareholders, and we have to find a way to allow them to continue to to to, to profit, but but at the same point in time to implement these policies. And I, I think again, working with them is really important, but it has to be now at a level where there is legislation and regulation because the you know what what what's gone on so far just hasn't worked. I think we're also seeing too many things as binary, um, and we need to we need to recognize that there isn't a di dichotomy. For instance, we need to recalibrate a range of human rights. Yes, you have a right to freedom of speech, but I have the right to be free from online violence. Yes, cri you know, crypto zealots, you have the right to um, you know um, to privacy and data protection and security. But children have a right to dignity. Um, and not have their um, rape, torture, and abuse on shared millions of times with groups of pedophiles. So we've got to we've got to have this recalibration and and find middle roads. 
Was, was that inflammatory? No, I, th I, think, I, think, I think as a panel, we went rogue some time ago now, and I think everyone wants to ask I am far too British to uh, host a panel of politicians, because I will never, ever <laughs> um, But But I mean, look, there was a really good segue there into our, our sort of final question, which is uh, on, on partnerships and on working beyond just the government itself. Uh, you know, what are the questions for the civil society organizations in here? And we have a whole host of folks here, from Ultraviolet to Free Press, we had, had Color of Change, and uh, the Global Project. But how does civil society partner with governments and regulators as part of an effective strategy for addressing online harm and misinformation? And as a counterbalance to executive power and to technology company lobbying? And I mean, specifically, we're thinking advocacy, education, research and insights into the online environment, but happy to take additional thoughts uh, as they may come up. Hmm. Maybe just, just one thought to, there, there are many things. You asked a dozen questions, I realize. So, uh, uh, <laughs> Choose one. <laughs> yeah. I, the last 12 months when I was out there on the road sort of talking about the DSA, the first argument I have heard, everybody started the conversation. Yeah, but this is going to stifle innovation. I mean, we all have heard that a million times, and of course you get over that. Uh, but I think there is a point here in the sense that, that we have sometimes not, fa not, we have not been able to show well where innovation actually comes in as the solution. Mm -hmm. Because a lot, a lot of these regulatory approaches need a lot of technology to implement it. And, and there are plenty of companies out there just waiting now, not waiting, actually started developing, on reporting tools, I mean, of course, none of that will be developed by the big guys. This will be all small companies who have good ideas of how that can be implemented, how that could be run. So there will be a lot of innovation sparked. We have seen that before. I mean, uh, I'll just give you an example on the GDPR. Plenty of people have been innovating around that, and there's a lot of technology being developed just to implement yeah. that regulation. And we will see it here as well. So in, in that sense, it's more maybe a driver of a new, new kind of innovation and just taking us to a new level. And I think that's where civil society also comes in because plenty of that has to be sort of maybe demonstrated or shown or highlighted from stakeholders that this, this is possible. This is not a difficult thing. I think we need to make sure that we don't see disintermediation of these safety tech um, startups and content moderation um, platforms. We've already seen uh, Discord acquire Centropy. Uh, we've seen uh, Two Hat was just um, uh, acquired by Microsoft. Uh, we saw this happening 20 years ago with the um, antivirus um, vendors and the um, anti-malware vendors. You know, the big operating systems and platforms sort of suck them up. Um, so we, we, need, we, we need to be thinking about that. But I would just say we don't do anything and cannot do anything um, in Australia without the advocacy community and with the NGOs. In fact, we have a grants program to NGOs that work in the online safety space because we want them to bring innovation. We also want diversity of thinking. Um, we want specialized agencies um, working with us to co-design um, youth-based content, called content, indigenous content. Um, you know, we're working with um, even the, the um, ABC, which is like our PBS, um, on um, social media self-defense programs for journalists who are women um, and are of intersectional backgrounds because women in the spotlight are 70% more likely to be targeted with misogynistic, racist, and homophobic online abuse. So we need to understand the vulnerabilities, and this is what um, civil society brings to us, um, and we need to work with them to for, towards solutions. Yeah, I think the research and analysis from civil society groups is really important. When we had the joint committee hearings on the online safety bill, I mean, there was, you, know, you had you know, the epilepsy society coming forward with evidence about how people with ep epilepsy are being proactively targeted with flashing images with the intent of causing them a seizure. You know, that, that, that is not an issue that was looked at until that society brought it, yeah. The, 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 uh, and until that was brought forward, you know, that, that was something that we, consider, we could look at as part of that bill. The children's charities you know, have done, done an excellent job as well, highlighting the impact on children to try and capture research that shows what the real experience is online, what people are really seeing. And Imran, I'll, I'll spare your blushes, you know, but I think the, the work CCDH has done, you know, actually analysing you know, live issues like you know, the disinformation dozen report saying, well, 
you know, tackling uh, anti-vax disinformation is difficult. Well, it's quite easy if you recognize there are 12 people in the world who are principally responsible for doing it. You know? You know, and, and that sort of research and analysis has been invaluable, and I think, in, in, in helping us understand the, the issues and the scope uh, of, of what's required. And thank you for the metaverse research about one, um, finding harm one in one in every, in every seven minutes. Um, I, I guess one thing I just want to say is we have to remain future focused. And if we're not learning the lessons of the Web 2.0 world and thinking about what hyper-realistic, high sensory experiences, teledildonics, you know, um, network sex toys and, and um, haptic suits, and I, we predicted, we, we do some tech trends and challenges, that rape by default was going to be um, a, a problem. And then Nina Jane Patel, one of the beta testers, um, in fact experienced that. So there's going to be heightened everything, in, including heightened harm. And so if we don't get ahead of this now and be thinking about building safety, privacy, and security by design, into you know the blockchain, which will be immutable. Does that mean child sexual abuse material and harassment content will be on a public ledger for everyone to see in perpetuity? We're not. We're, there's so much hype that goes into the building of these new business models and the in the metaverse. We're not thinking about how we alleviate harm in these worlds. Yeah. Um, make no mistake that the trends just drive the stakes higher and higher in this space from here, for sure, guaranteed. Um, in terms of the role of civil society, um, what I would say is, as a, as a content regulator engaging in this space, my office was at its best when we were listening rather than asserting an expertise or, or a view or an objective. So when we engaged with communities, when we engaged with faith groups, when we engaged with survivor groups, when we engaged with experts on suicide and depression, um, when we engage with Māori and Pacifica communities, um, women suffering the, mis the misogynistic hate and issues that we've been hearing about. Um, a, a big part of my office's function was to um, put in place age restrictions and advisory warning notes for, for children. And I said, well, have, have we talked to them? And um, part of the innovation that we put in place was a youth advisory panel of 12 really engaged teens who trusted us and told us what was going on. And it was very scary and sometimes confronting, but we needed to know. So part of this whole thing to work involves that open dialogue and communication and civil society groups are utterly crucial in that. Now, now what we're talking about here, of course, involves another kind of contrast, another tension between what we're talking about in terms of an international kind of accord and approach and synergy and the need for an independent regulator within a nation to be engaging with the people who are most vulnerable, the people that we are doing all of this for. Mm -hmm. um, I think that can be reconciled. I think you absolutely can put in place a structure that involves um, those, those so sorts of standards that, that actually we can dock into while still allowing space for the vulnerable communities in each of our countries to have a voice and have a say in how that is implemented. Just a, another, uh, another thought, I, I do believe that another very important aspect of civil society is to be recognized as trusted reporters. Um, by the platforms in order to report hate content online. It's, it's, it's proven very successful. Um, and, and secondly, uh, going back to the idea of education, I have to say that as a legislator, it's been civil society more than anything else uh, that's educated me with respect to what is actually happening online. For example, whether uh, recently ISD did a really interesting presentation for us on how across all of the platforms, the letter Z which is the Kremlin shorthand for the Russian invasion, has been weaponized by supporters of QAnon to present an anti semitic <coughs> between Putin's war and the conspiracy movement's theories about overturning the results of the 2020 presidential election in the US. Like, th there is so much that I, as a legislator, learned from civil society, which will help me make better laws and, and better and better policy making. And, and, and I think that without civil society, we, we would not be educated in terms of legislation. Thanks, and we, we've got one final question. We've got a tiny bit of time left before the end. So um, just a sort of a minute or two from each. But 
Question five, if time. What are the next steps? What actions will you take when you go home? Damien. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we are, you know, in, in, in Europe, we're in the position where we've got legislation that we've uh, worked through, it's going through Parliament. Um, we have that iterative process, but I think um, we also need to look at how we create frameworks to keep the debate going. And I think, I think we have a system where we have you know, increasing coordination between governments. I think the declaration on the future of the internet that was published last month was a, a good statement of intent there. I think the, regulate, the global regulatory bodies, both on, I think, competition and, and protection and data uh, protection, I think, uh, I seem to have very good relationships. Whenever I speak to people who work there, I'm always being told you know, what good working relationships they have. I think looking at you know, how we broaden that out in terms of partnerships between parliaments and parliamentarians to sort of rally behind things like the, the Declaration on the Future of the Internet to start to explore beyond just the safety legislation where we think there are, there are more areas for cooperation and partnership. I think that needs to be the, the way the debate runs. I was going to say, I feel like we're actually living in a world of principles fatigue. Um, and, um, you know, there are voluntary principles, there are safety by design principles, there are new um, CSA principles, there are TBIC principles. But principles-based frameworks are good, but they're only useful if they're being implemented. So I guess my commitment is um, we will continue to try and influence and share so that more people can use for, uh, learn from us. I have a strong bias for action. And I think we need to see more tangible action um, around the world. So after this, I'll be going, we'll be going up to New York and to Brussels and London and Paris and Lille. We'll try and evangelize and bring people along with us because it does, it, it's, it's got to be all of us together across sectors and around the world. Um, you know, harnessing the benefits of technology and minimizing the risks and learning from each other. We shouldn't be reinventing the wheel here. Uh, I've got to tell you, as someone who kind of had to write a playbook as she went along and not having any, anyone or anything to learn from, um, I, I suppose that, um, that, that's, that Greenfields pioneering is, is um, a gift, but it, it's, it's, it's better to have team members. Um. Interestingly, when, when just a few weeks ago, the Digital Services Act received its political agreement, so it will enter into force in September. Don't quote me on that, but uh, sort of that time frame should be feasible, it seems. Uh, there was a change made in terms of who is going to be the enforcer for the very large online platforms. And the Commission proposal didn't propose the Commission, but the Member States, and particularly the Parliament, said, no, 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 we want one enforcer, and it's going to be the Commission. So, so the action, actually, the surprise action for us is, oh, well, damn, you know, the, the baby we wanted to give to somebody else, we actually got it back. <laughs> so, so we will, over the summer, work on the implementation rules because principles frameworks are excellent, but they're only the basis. It's the implementation which makes the difference. Yep. What's the KPI for a given company where you say they do well or we need to investigate? You know, we don't know the KPI and certainly not the number associated with that one. So I think this is the work we are going to engage between now and probably the end of the year because the whole thing will be applicable in spring next year. And uh, we shall see then. I, 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 from, from my perspective, uh, although I, I don't get to go back home because I'm right here, um, <laughs> what, one of the things that, I, that I'm learning from this, and which I've you know, kind of known is that we need to learn from other legislators. I'm very well aware of the UK online harms bill, but until these conversations with Julie, I, I wasn't aware of how advanced Australia and New Zealand were in, in these areas. Although we've basically taken a carbon copy of the requirement for social media providers to pay for news um, from the Australian bill. Um, and, and that's coming to committee very shortly. Uh, so I, I think, I think okay. to, to my electors in Canada, is we've got to move and catch up to foreign jurisdictions that have already legislated in this area. We're not at implementation stage yet. We need to legislate. Um, yeah, that's right. And, and I can tell you from my experience in terms of stepping into this space, there's kind of three phases that you go through. To begin with, the companies will say, well, what are you doing? Why legislate? There isn't really 
that big a problem here, really, when you look at it really closely. And then you give them the evidence and you give them the research and you make it impossible for them to hold that position. And they go, oh yeah, okay, well, there, yes, there is a problem, but you know, the, the measures that you'd be proposing to address this, they're not really effective, you know, still there's gonna be, it's, it's, it's just too difficult. And then you step through the measures that you're gonna put in place that will be effective. And at that point they go, oh, you're talking about measures that will be effective. You will break the internet. <laughs> and I can tell you, you won't break the internet. <laughs> that thing is one tough sucker, you'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> Yeah. That's it. It's just the irony that they say, you know, they often say, well, we, welcome, we welcome legislation, you know, we, welcome, we want certainty. <laughs> I can't ever think in the years I've been doing on this, the time when a company came to me and said, God, you know, you, you guys have got to be legislating fast now, it's the complete wild west out there. You know, yeah. you got to be, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, look, thank you very much to the panel. I mean, from, this isn't on my, on my cheat sheets, but from our perspective, having brought together for the, for the first time in quite a while, a bunch of legislators from key countries already seeking to take action. This has been incredibly useful and we are very grateful to those who've come today from civil society, from governments, from regulators all around the world because it's precisely this dialogue. The truth is that when we were having conversations with individual nations, most of them didn't really know what was going on elsewhere. Even sometimes talking to EU officials about what was happening in the UK, which is their close neighbour, even if they're not close friends anymore. Um, <laughs> But I think that it's really valuable to continue these fora. And the other point I'd make, and this is a sort of, an, it's a, a, a corollary point, is disinformation and hate affect everything that we also are prioritizing in, in international cooperation right now. Yeah. We work on climate change at CCDH. Climate denial is being distributed through online networks at a phenomenal pace, reshaping people's perceptions of the climate crisis. If you care about sexual and reproductive rights, if you care about a whole raft of issues, counter-terrorism, counter-violent extremism, and making sure that when we discuss those issues, a component of it is allocated to disinformation and, social, and the role that social media plays so that we build that cross-sectoral as well as intergovernmental cooperation and consensus around both the situation analysis and what we're gonna have to do to start to deal with it. I think that's terribly important. And, you know, CCDH, that is the model that we've chosen as to how we operate. So we're, you know, we're here to help. We're here to provide the evidence that you need along the way. And we're very, very grateful indeed. So, um, once again, thank you so much to our wonderful panel. And, uh, yeah.